What's up guys, this is Brad at Hourglass Fab. Today I want to talk a little bit about TIG welding pulse. Now that's manual pulse with your foot, that's going to be machine pulse where the machine's actually doing the pulsing for you. So before we get into that, what I want to talk about real quick is I just hit a thousand subscribers, over a thousand subscribers on YouTube. I hit 20,000 Instagram followers. So we're going to be doing a giveaway coming up shortly, so stay tuned for that. I'll be announcing that in the next probably two weeks or so. Anyways, guys, let's get into it. So pretty much, you're going to have a couple of pulse settings that work for you. You're going to figure out what those numbers are. They could vary from somebody else's numbers by just a couple, but they make all the difference in the world. So typically when I'm using pulse on my machine, I have a couple of different pulse settings that I'm going to go to for different applications. Now one pulse per second is kind of my go-to. It's a nice cruise, you're just cruising along nice and consistent. and your machine's doing all the work for you. But this is the thing, when you're pulse welding, what you need to wait for is you need to wait for it to actually wet out. You need to wait for your puddle to hit peak amperage, and then you add filler rod, and then you hit your background current, and then you wait and you move on your background so you freeze that puddle, and then peak amperage, you dab your rod again. So really what you wanna do is you wanna avoid stepping over more than 50%. Now when I talk about that, you're gonna Dab your rod and you're gonna move over, but don't move over more than 50% of the width of that previous dime stack crescent shape, okay? So you add rod and you move over maybe 30%, maybe 40%, add rod again. When you start spacing your dimes way out, then you start incorporating stress risers into that and that's no good for business. Now 33% on time, 33% background, and 33 pulses per second is a little tip that I picked up from Jody over at Welding Tips and Tricks. Obviously, you're probably following the guy, he's awesome. Anyways, 33%, 33%, and 33 pulses per second. It's a pretty good go-to for a lot of different applications. Everybody has their specific. Some people won't weld over 50 pulses per second. Some people weld at 120, 130 pulses per second. It's kind of just preference. So you have one pulse per second, you're gonna have 33 pulses per second, and then you're gonna have the 100 pulse per second range. Now in between one and 33, I stay away from. Um, sometimes I'll go two to three, but as soon as you get into like five, six, 10 pulses per second, it's really bad for your eyes. I'm not saying it's gonna hurt your eyes, it's just, it's like a constant strobe light. And you can't, really tell when to add filler rod, you can't tell when your puddle's wetted out, and you're kind of just sitting there like, whoa, what's going on here? So, in between one and 33, I kind of try and stay away from, but I weld on typically one, two, maybe three, 33, and then I weld on 100 pulses per second. And those are just different applications. The faster the pulse per second, it kind of gives your puddle a little more rigidity, and it keeps it there. If you're doing any buildup work, if you're doing any edge welds, typically 33 to 100 pulses per second is really gonna kinda stick that puddle wherever it's at. It's not gonna wonder a whole lot. All of that precise pulsing that's going on keeps the puddle really stable. Now if we tack up some stainless steel, this is some .040 thick stainless steel, 40 thousandths thick. This is some 304. Now what we're going to do here is we're going to do an autogenous weld on the outside corner of that joint. Now autogenous means that you're welding without filler rods, so you're basically fusing two pieces of metal together as you move along. So the beauty about welding something autogenous or fusing that part together, when it's really thin sheet metal, really thin sheet metal wants to warp. As soon as you put a little bit of heat into it, it curls up into a little ball and it doesn't want to play nice. 
So the beauty about pulse welding is it keeps your input down. Your heat input, you can pull a lot of heat out of the part. Your heat input is, is very light. Your heat input marks, your heat affected zone along your weld is gonna be really thin and really tight close to that weld because you're really minimizing the heat as your arc goes from on time to off time, on, off, on, off. So all of that time that your arc would have been just sitting on that piece of metal, full amperage as you're dabbing along, that off time really, really eliminates a lot of heat. Now the same thing, here's a T-joint and we're fuse welding a T-joint. Now any fuse welding needs really tight fit ups. So if you're gonna fuse weld anything and there's any gaps or anything, you're gonna blow it out. It's not gonna stick together. So you need to make sure you go along and put a lot of tacks on anything that you're gonna fuse, press everything down, make sure it's a nice, nice tight fit up. Now in the welding world, there's a lot of autogenous welding. There's a lot of fuse welding when it comes to stainless, whether that's food grade stuff, or that's stainless steel dishwashers at a manufacturing facility, you know, production place. Just fuse welding on nuts onto the backside of holes that were CNC lasered out for assemblies or parts or whatever that go together. Fuse welding comes in handy. Now another thing that fuse welding comes in handy for is obviously tacking parts up. Sometimes we don't have three hands. Actually, all the time we don't have three hands. So sometimes we need to free that up. Now with MIG welding, you have a torch, or you have a gun, and you have a trigger. And you can hold something on the, with the other hand as you tack it up. Now with TIG welding, you have to kind of do the same thing. Now you can fuse weld, tack, big bursts of amperage, turn your machine all the way up depending on the material thickness and just pound your foot pedal and it's gonna stick those two things together. That really comes in handy in certain occasions where you don't have multiple hands available. An exercise I do from time to time is actually taking some bar stock and then weaving the edge of that bar stock and typically that's gonna be about a quarter inch wide. Now the beauty about this is for one you get really good at edge control. Another thing is high pulses per second are going to keep that puddle planted so you can get really close to the edge. You can dab your rod and move to the other side and you're not gonna blow that edge out. You don't need pulse. Okay, let's just be honest. People have been welding without pulse a heck of a lot longer than they have with it. Now as technology advances, you know there's a lot more things that are readily available to the everyday guy like me and you. Now there's a lot of machines out there that are very reasonably priced and they still do just as good a job as other machines. Now the reliability factor is a totally different story. Being able to have it maintenanced in the USA is a totally different story because maybe they don't have the parts. But basically anybody can go out there with a thousand to fifteen hundred bucks and pick up a decent machine that has all the fancy bells and whistles. When I first got into welding, okay, I had a... Eastwood TIG 200, straight DC machine, little tiny argon bottle, little air-cooled 125 amp number nine torch, um, and the machine was bare bones. It was basically set your amperage and that's it. No post full adjustments, no, um, no frequency, no AC frequency. Obviously it was a DC machine, but you had no post flow, no pre flow, nothing like that. And it basically just kind of got me introduced into what is a TIG torch, what is a piece of filler rod, and, you know, I kind of learned off that machine. The big thing when it comes to a machine that you need, in my opinion, is post flow. That is going to be the kind of determining factor in how you weld. You don't need the fancy settings, you don't need the pulse, you don't need any of that stuff, but post flow is important. So even with the bare bones and just a little bit of skill, you guys can lay down welds just as good as anybody running a Miller or, you know, running a Fronius machine or any of that stuff, guys. Come on now. Don't think you need a better machine to run better welds because it's not going to happen. You're going to get your newer, nicer, fancier machine. You're going to plug it in. You're going to rip open your bottle of Argon and light up. And your welds are going to look just as good as they looked on that previous machine that you just cashed in. Now, I don't typically use pulse all the time. The higher the pulse... Sometimes I'll use 100 pulses per second on sheet metal. It tends to help pull the heat out of sheet metal a little bit. Now one pulse per second on sheet metal is a little long. That on and off time, you know, 
allows a lot of heat to build up and you can run sheet metal without pulse. You can run sheet metal just fine. 33 pulses per second I tend to use on sheet metal as well or you know it just kind of depends on the mood. It depends on how I'm feeling. But higher pulse is going to keep that puddle nice and tight and it's going to be easier to work with. So if you're using anything like silicon bronze where you want to just light up but you don't want to puddle that base metal and you want to add silicon bronze as a TIG brazing rod, pulses are going to really dial that in. Silicon bronze is kind of really runny and it's not very defined when you're welding unless it's on some really thick stuff that can really pull that heat out and cause that ripple. So when you're welding silicon bronze and stuff like that, pulsing is really beneficial. Whether it's one pulse per second or 33 pulses per second, it keeps that silicon bronze in line and you can just lay it down. Now what I do a lot is I pulse manually with my foot and that looks like this. Now pulsing manually with your foot is going to give you total control of when that current is on and when that current is off. So if you're in an uncomfortable position or you're welding around something that's round or you're doing chassis or tube work or maybe a motorcycle frame, what's going to really benefit you is if you can control that pulse with your foot. Now it's easy to pulse around stuff because you can keep the heat input out and you can kind of lay it down where you want to lay it down and you're not moving along with the machine's pulse and you're trying to hurry and everything's getting very inconsistent. When you're welding around something or you're really uncomfortable or maybe you're doing like some chassis work, manually pulsing with the foot pedal is the best way to do it. It allows control. You can just add filler when you want to add filler. But another thing to remember when you're manually pulsing with the foot pedal is you need to get into a rhythm and it'll help you get into a rhythm and you'll know when you need to add filler rod at what time and you'll just pretty much just be moving down the line and when you're done you snap that arc out and you raise your hood you look at your weld and it's super consistent you can't even tell any difference in spacing between the ripples and that's when you know you're really dialed in and you're moving along and you have a good flow now obviously when the camera's four inches away from my hand and my filler rod's bouncing into stuff, I'm all crammed standing up to the side trying to weld one of these little coupons. The welds don't look as good as they do if I was comfortable. So take that into consideration guys. Take this for what it's worth. If you're using Pulse, awesome. If you have Pulse but you haven't really messed with it, I really encourage you guys, play with the Pulse. See what it does, see how it manipulates the puddle. Just change it to different, you maybe try one second, maybe try 33, 100. Go as high as you can possibly go. And see what that does to the actual puddle and what that does to the weld. And maybe you'll find that something helps you and it makes your welds look better and makes everything look more consistent. At the end of the day, Pulse is basically designed to assist in a more stable, solid, smooth puddle. Kind of just making everything a lot smoother and keeping things in line and reducing heat input in sheet metal parts. So I'll say it again guys, you don't need pulse. You can pulse manually with your foot. I do 90% of the time. I can add filler rod when I want to add filler rod and I can move along at my speed. Depending on how far I'm off that pedal for how long, it depends on how much heat I'm pulling out of that part. Now your heat affected zone is going to be significantly reduced when you're using pulse and using pulse right. You're going to have a super tight heat affected zone right on the outside edges of your weld and everything is going to be lined up nice and straight. At the end of the day, what are we trying to do guys? We're trying to lay down nice consistent welds with good color and do them however we can do them that's going to work for us. So if pulse works, great. If something else works for you, great. Do what you want, do what makes you happy and do what works for you and try and make every single weld just as good as the last, if not better. Don't just stop, you know, don't stop progressing. Progressing is so important and progressing is fun. And if you can sit there and you can go and spend 30 minutes out there, 10 minutes out in the garage or 10 minutes on your lunch break at work, just trying to do something that you couldn't do the day before and working towards something, it's going to make you a thousand times better. And if you're working in the shop and there's like some CNC machinists or, you know, there's a manual machine shop or there's some guy down cutting tube with a laser, whatever, 
go, you know, make conversation and see if you can't pick something up, see if you can't learn something from these guys because all of these skills are going to factor into what you're focusing on and they're going to help you later on down the road. Anyways, guys, as always, thank you so much for watching. I really appreciate it. If you have any questions, comments, concerns, throw them down in the comment box. Like this video if you got anything out of it. Hit that subscribe button if you want to follow along with us. Stay tuned for that giveaway coming up in a couple of weeks.